Good afternoon. Well, thank you so much for having us here. I am Amy Behrens. This is Nina. Um, so we are going to be talking to you today a bit about research um, and using research to drive growth. So I'll start a little bit just with a bit of background on who Fusion Hill is. Uh, we are located just down the street, actually. Uh, we are a research strategy and creative firm. Um, our fear, one of our fearless leaders, Casey, is here. Carrie's tuned in digitally. Um, Carrie and Casey started Fusion Hill uh, 17 years ago um, on the premise of wanting an agency that places equal weight and emphasis on both great research and great creative, with strategy sort of in the middle, the bridge of the two. And so that's what we still do today. Um, Fusion Hill, because of its founding, has always been a huge supporter of startups and uh, with a special place in our hearts for women-owned women -owned small businesses. Um, and so we're really happy to be here and happy to be talking with you. So a bit about what we do, as I mentioned, we do research and creative. Uh, we focus on qualitative research, but we'll talk through some other research methodologies as well. And we focus on the three main industries that you see on the slide, uh, healthcare technology and financial services. So while we are primarily work for Fortune 100 companies, a lot of the methods, a lot of the questions that our clients are asking us are very applicable to companies like all of yours. So we'll talk about how those research methods and processes can apply, uh, whether you're just getting your business up off the ground or you're a few, uh, you have a few years behind you, research is really key to incorporate at any point in the game and we'll be talking through that. Awesome. Great, so um, why do research? Why is that important? Why are we here? Why are we such big advocates of it? And um, it's a pretty simple answer. Research helps you make smarter, more informed decisions as a business, right? That's it, we could go home, that's all you need to know. <laughs> um, uh, really, it should, it should be at the core of everything you're doing, everything you're thinking about. It's an investment that you make, there it is, um, to make sure that you're finding the right business opportunities and um, you're making the right decisions as you go. And it should really, it can really take place across any and all parts of your business strategy. So you might be thinking about um, product innovation, right? What's the next product we wanna come up with? Uh, you might be thinking, who are our competitors? How do we know where we fall in the landscape? Um, to more tactical things like, hey, what is our pricing strategy? How do we possibly determine that? Research um, plays a pivotal role in all of that. Um, we're not saying that research is the only input that should go into your business strategy, but it should always be at the table. It's a, a part of the family, it should always be there. And the other reason it's important, maybe the most important reason here, is that you wanna be creating a product or service that people need and actually want, right? Um, I'm sure everyone here has fantastic ideas, our entrepreneurs have, uh, have uh, great marketing skills, can sell great products, come up with great things, um, but you are pulled in a lot of different directions as a startup. So think of research and going back to your customer as really kind of your true north. Um, think of it as a way to recenter, to refocus when your investors, your VCs are asking you for this or that or thinking you should go in this direction. Um, it's a way to to hold back some of our biases that we might have as the people who are coming up with these great ideas. Um, it's always about going back and testing it with your customers. Other thing to keep in mind is VCs and investors really want to know that while you have that passion for what you're creating, that you have that drive as a, a business owner, that you're also anchored in reality that you have done your research, that you have gone to customers, you have um, asked what they want, and that you are delivering on that. Um, the other benefit of research is it really, um, it can really bring your pitch to life uh, in a really important way. So I think the, the VCs, the investors sitting on the other side of the table or the other side of Zoom, uh, they expect you to pitch your product or your service as the greatest thing that's ever been out there. But when they watch a video or see a quote of an actual potential customer or prospect talking about their pain points, their barriers, and how your product addresses that, 
that's what draws them in, right? That's what they want to see. Um, and stories really sell. So the ability to bring that empathy, bring the story back into it, especially if they've seen a million um, slides before on, on profits and, and potential, that's great. But really bringing that customer voice makes a big difference. And so research can really um, impact any part of your growth trajectory. We're going to walk through three different kind of uh, stages of your growth and where you might use research. This isn't set in stone. It doesn't mean you can't use different parts across. But let's think about starting with your early strategies. So you're about to launch, or maybe you've just launched. It's all about setting your company or your product or service up for success. So at the base, you're trying to figure out who are you as a company? What is your product? What are you going to sell it for? And how are you going to get it out there? All things that can be answered with research. So here are some of the, the types of research you might be doing. You might be looking at a competitive audit. You might want to see what your customers or prospects think of all the different companies out there selling this same or similar product or service. And they're going to help you find that sweet spot. Where is that gap? And that's maybe how you want to market your product or who you are. Um, you're going to want to, uh, to do some product concepting. So at the base, when you come up with a new product or service, what is that offering going to be? Research can help you. Your customers, your prospects can help you figure that out. Um, and then how do you position that product? Um, what are you going to, uh, yeah, what's the, the role it's going to play in the market? Uh, pricing strategy, pretty tactical one, but are there different pricing strategies based on different types of customers? What do they want? How are, what are they going to pay a premium for? All questions you can answer with research. And then uh, your marketing plan, right? So how are you even going to launch? Who are you going to be? Um, so all of those are those early considerations you're making. And then you might move into this kind of middle stage of growth, where your product, your service is out there. Um, you're starting to establish yourself. And at this phase, it's really about how do you get people to know who you are? And how do you get them to consider your product or service? And then how do you acquire customers? So this middle stage, it's all about growth, right? How do we scale? Our thing is out there. How do we get people to buy into it? So at this phase, you're really thinking about who is our customer? How do they come to us? How do they choose us over other services or products? And then what is their experience like? once they choose our product? And how can we make that experience better and then get more customers by making that experience better? Uh, you also might be doing a little customer segmentation. So that's a fancy way of saying, um, I don't know, maybe you, have, maybe you sell a software and you have a lot of customers who are in the education space and a lot of customers who are in the, I don't know, uh, convenience store space. You're going to want to understand how those two audiences are different, how they're utilizing your product differently, how you can maybe tweak your product to better fit each one, and how to market to each of those. Right? So these are all things that you're doing in this middle phase. Um, you're optimizing your product. So when you launch, as startups, you, you just need to get your product out there. But at this phase, you might be kind of polishing, kind of um, uh, tweaking. Uh, as it's been out there, as you've asked customers about it. At this phase, you're also thinking about advertising research. So where are our customers and prospects going for information? What websites do they trust? What sources do they trust? Um, who do we need for testimonials? Who are they listening to? Uh, you might be thinking about your digital strategy, too. So now that our product's out there, how do we make the best possible user experience and, and digital experience possible? And then you're always kind of thinking about your brand identity and your brand story. So our product is launched. We have some customers. Who are we? Who do they think we are? And who do we want to keep becoming? Um, so this is our middle phase here. And then as you become more established, it's all about refining and retaining. So you want to be refining your product, constantly iterating on it. And research comes into play here and uh, retaining those customers that you have currently, uh, and, and making sure that they're not straying right when something new comes. So at this phase, 
you're thinking a lot about um, who are our customers and our loyal customers at their core, and how do we continue creating products that uh, align with them, that interest them, that keep them loyal. You're thinking about product iterations and renovations, right? They're, you know, maybe over the course of two, maybe two or three years in, now that you've launched, there's a whole slew of new competitors uh, with a bunch of new products. So what do you need to be doing to iterate on your product? That's happening in these phases. Uh, trend spotting, right? So we've got a great product. It's been out there a couple years now, but what do we need to be thinking about five years from now? What are people going towards? What are the trends going to be? And how can we prepare for that? All great questions to answer via research. Um, and then new growth. So hey, maybe you've got a great service, and you've got a great uh, set of customers. Everything's going swell. But you want to expand, right? So what is that next product you want to add on? What's going to fit well under your umbrella? These are all questions that your customers, your prospects can help you answer. And maybe you've got a great customer base, but you're thinking, hey, let's, there's, there's a whole bunch of people in the education segment or in the, I don't know, engineering world that we can go after. So at this phase, you're really thinking, what are those next customer groups that we want to go after? And how do we market our product or change our product to meet their needs? And then finally, you're thinking about uh, rebranding, integrating additional brands into that umbrella. So again, this phase is really about just constant iteration. So this can be a, a kind of the, the phases for a one-person company. This can be the phases for, um, I don't know, Boston Scientific launching a new device, right, or entering a new segment. It's, uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter what size company you are, but you kind of constantly want to be infusing research into what you're doing. Any questions as we go? Yes, Kelvin. Yeah, so I'm trying to, I'll do to my, yeah. So pricing elasticity is like a, a big one, right? Like the price sensitivity of your users. What have you guys seen as some of the better methods in a proactive manner to really get more precise around the price sensitivity of your users? Yeah, great question. Go ahead. Yeah, I would say there's a couple of different ways. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about methods, but it certainly applies to this. Um, keeping a pulse on what the industry, competitors, your competitors are doing is really key. So we'll talk about secondary research. And even though that's not our bread and butter necessarily, it's really key to just keep a pulse on, on what others in, in the industry, the others you're kind of going up against, are doing. Um, similarly, just getting out and talking to people, how much are you willing to pay? How much did you pay for this? Um, you know, things are changing is, you know, what are the different factors you're considering when you're thinking about price and how much you'll pay? So just constantly getting out there and talking to people and understanding what's changing, what considerations um, are evolving for them. Um, and then, you know, more quantitatively, a survey is great to just kind of ask that question. And you can get it out to lots of different people and get a sense for, um, you know, here's the range that most people are willing to pay for this certain thing. And so let's go with that moving forward. So those are all different inputs to, to keep in mind. Yeah, I can give you a great example. Right now, we're working on a project with um, uh, a major technology company. And they're coming out with a new, uh, an existing tool, but that will do a lot of new things for you. So no longer just for entertainment, but for a number of other things. And they're trying to figure out, yeah, how the heck do we price this? There's nothing like this that exists on the market. So what they're doing is we're starting with some qualitative research, what we're doing for them, which is talking to customers, asking them kind of, have you ever considered paying $1,000 for a product like this? And the first reaction is, well, no. The, product, the products that are out there are in the 500 range, and that's what I'm going to pay. OK, now let's imagine, what would you pay more for? And that's where we are starting to get some great feature ideation from customers. I'd be willing to pay more for a bundle of, of features, or this product plus a subscription, uh, a long-term subscription, or you know, it might just be a, a more functional product, or whatever it is. And then we can take those features, take those ideas, and test them in quant research, so in a survey, to validate 
some of those findings. So in that way, it doesn't, yeah, your, your product, uh, your product pricing strategy might be for your product today and for what, it, what people will pay for the current version, but it, you can also be ideating via research on new features that will push the price up. I like that hook. Like mm -hmm. the, you know, going from would you pay this, and they're saying no, and, but then you're also going back and also say, well, tell me what you would pay more for. So it kind of sets the stage to get some really great ideation and things you might not have considered before. Yeah, yeah. One, oh, go ahead. Just understanding that value is, cute, is really important too, to know that, uh, to not only allow you to potentially charge more, but also understand how to talk about your product too. If this is the price point, here are the things we wanna make sure we're highlighting and talking about in the messaging to make sure that people are, uh, are buying into it and, and deeming that price worth it. And you're, I, I don't know, we've been doing research for almost a decade and customers, consumers will never stop impressing you. They are so smart. They know what they want. They come up with fantastic ideas. They're not um, confined by what you're confined by every day as business owners, as startups, of what is reality, what your budgets are, what your VCs want. They're just free thinking. So when they're thinking of, of features, they come up with some fantastic ideas. Um, so yeah, you always want to go back to them because they'll tell you what, you, what value you provide them. They don't, you'll, you'll, um, you'll share it back with them in your marketing, but they're the ones who need to tell you what the value is. All right, so we're gonna move into talking a bit about the research process. So you've got all these questions, you've got all these things you're trying to figure out and questions you wanna ask. How do you go about actually getting answers to those questions? So we thought it was important to start with how to determine your research objectives. So if you're heading into a specific initiative, um, you know, I do this for a living and my head is sort of spinning based on that last slide, so yours might be too, um, which is why it's really important when you're setting up a, a specific project or study to boil down your focus a little bit. Set up your research objectives to make sure that they will help you to be successful in the end. And there's a couple of ways to do this. It starts to really, it helps to really start from the top down. So think, you know, what, what is the business background? What is the context here? Uh, what are my end goals? You know, am I trying to drive acquisition? Am I trying to increase sales? Am I trying to improve customer, the customer experience and customer satisfaction? Really kind of determining what those end goals are is important to help you determine what are the really critical questions we want to ask and have answered. So um, once you know those end goals and kind of the one that you want to focus on or a couple that you want to focus on, you know, from there, just create a laundry list of all the questions that you want to have answered that will help you achieve that end goal. And then it's just a matter of sort of translating those questions into research objectives. At the top of this slide, you see a couple of buzzwords that are a little cheesy to think that your objective should always start with one of those words, but it really does help you to, to uh, determine, you know, are these true objectives? Are we setting out to really learn something that will help us achieve those end goals? And so once those are translated into objectives, then it's a matter of prioritization. Um, you know, what, what are the, the must-knows versus the, the nice-to-knows? Um, what are the questions we really need to answer to help us get to that, that end goal? Um, so a couple of tactics, you know, a working session is what we typically recommend to our clients. Some workshops, some immersion sessions are helpful to not only get everyone on the same page as to what questions do we want to ask and what goals do we want to achieve, um, it also helps to get buy-in. You know, if everyone's on board, your whole project, your whole initiative is going to run a lot more smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, so having that kickoff conversation, getting everyone together is really key as you're, as you're setting things up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would add here, um, really hearing all the hypotheses people have on your team. Because the, and let's say you're a bigger team, the engineering team might have totally different ideas of what they think the customer wants versus you know, the sales and marketing team. And so getting everyone in a room and hearing all those so that everyone knows, wow, we, maybe we don't know the answer to this. We all think we do in our own departments, but it makes sense, we need to go ask, right? Because we, are, we all see the business objective from different angles. 
and helping to understand, uh, or I should say, understanding those hypotheses and then using some of the, the words at the top of this slide, also make sure you're sort of taking a step back and not heading into the research with preconceived notions or hypotheses that you're just seeking to, to validate or to test, um, but kind of backing up and, and trying to figure out what do we actually want to learn. So if we have this hypothesis, let's take a step back and say, you know, instead of validating that this is true, <laughs> um, let's take a step back and really ask the question to understand if it is or not or, or what else might be the case. And so with that, we have a couple of watch outs we'll flip through. And these are things we've seen in our experience. Clients come to us, and so we help to sometimes navigate them to really make sure that their, their project has a key focus. Um, so the first watch out is, are we trying to answer too many questions or solve multiple business challenges with one project? So if we're trying to figure out who our target consumer is and our next you know, innovation opportunity, that's probably, you're probably biting off too much uh, more than you can chew, and you, you, you likely won't be successful at the end. So consider narrowing that focus, maybe break that initiative into two separate things, um, or kind of, again, pare down your research questions. What do you really need to know versus what to get, again, that, that end goal versus what is just a, maybe a nice to know? Similarly, are we trying to engage multiple audiences for different reasons? So are we wanting to talk with prospects to understand why they're not purchasing our product, but also talk with our loyal customers to understand what keeps them coming back? Um, again, maybe think about splitting that into two separate initiatives to make sure your focus is really clear and you're really answering a, a key question. We understand the tendency to want to, if you're going to talk to customers, it's so tempting to just throw every single question you have into the mix. Um, and we see that all the time and we totally get it. And to some extent, feel free to do that. You know, add a couple of questions in if you're going out there anyway. Um, but just really keeping your, your, your focus on that core goal um, will really help you uh, to, to stay focused throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. Um, another watch out is, we, are we asking consumers or customers for the answers? Um, this we see a lot too, and instead of it, you know, going back to the pricing question, instead of what would you be willing to pay for this, it's more digging a little bit deeper to Nina's point to understand what's really driving the different things you're considering as you're, um, as you're weighing your different options. You know, what, what are you looking for? What do you value? And have that drive your pricing decision versus just simply going out to customers and, and asking them the, the question. Because spoiler alert, they're always going to want something less expensive than what you have to <laughs> offer. And then we kind of touched on this last one, but are we trying to validate something we want to be true? And we do see this a lot too. This is a benefit to, um, to working with a third party to ask them these questions, but also just think through it yourselves. You know, we have this hypothesis. We really want it to be true because our stakeholders are already three steps ahead and making decisions. It's really worth it to take a step back and say, instead of trying to prove that this is true, really ask the broad, open-ended questions to understand, you know, what the thought process is, what customers are thinking, um, to help you again drive that decision versus um, versus hypotheses or assumptions or things like that. Yeah. Yeah, and in research, you're not always going to hear what you want to hear, but what you need to hear so that you can stop whatever you know, trajectory you're going in early enough instead of saying, you know, we're just going to keep going on this, biasing your research, asking certain questions to hear that. You're better off hearing what you don't want to hear potentially, making a uh, shift in your strategy earlier on, and then being more successful. Right? So yeah, really try to take this don't try to validate those hypotheses like Amy mentioned. Yeah, that's something we often talk with clients about upfront to say, you know, we might be the, the bears of bad news in this. We had a, a project, um, a client who was coming to us to understand if they should um, acquire, a, it was a beauty company. They, want, they were thinking about acquiring a, a company that made Botox, like Botox competitor, toxins and fillers. And they wanted us, and they hired us to understand what their kind of go-to-market approach should be, and and where the opportunity is for this. And we did a multi-country study, international, um, to understand. We talked with dermatologists, uh, plastic surgeons, and consumers, and came back and said, 
don't do it. <laughs> There's no opportunity. Um, and that research was really valuable. Otherwise, they would have made a, a not so great business decision. So that's also really good research um, and, and makes that investment worthwhile. Any questions before we jump into an activity? Yeah. Uh, we talk about like sample size, right? What are some good rules of thumb? You know, is it n equals five? Is it n equals thirty? But what do you guys think of? Obviously, it probably depends on the situation. But what are some general rules of thumb when it comes to uh, sample size to mm -hmm. make it statistically significant? Yeah, that's a great question. So we operate in the world of qual, so nothing is statistically significant. We're talking with smaller sample sizes to really dig deep and understand the why. Um, I'll say a couple things and then I'll pass it over to Nina. One is one of our philosophies, and we touched again on this again at the end, is that any research is better than no research. So if you can only get in front of a couple of people, do it. It's still worth it. Um, and that might be especially relevant as you're just getting started or you don't have huge budgets. That's okay. There are lots of ways to just get started and just talk to people you know, talk to, you know, hire some college students to talk to people, whatever works. Um, the other rule of thumb that we follow is uh, to talk with, our, our magic number tends to be six. Um, you want to talk with six people of any one type just to make sure that you're hearing themes and consistencies among that group. So that could be um, you know, six customers and six prospects. That could be six um, people in the education sector and six people in the convenience source you know, vertical. Um, six allows you to make sure you're accounting for any kind of one-offs or anomalies or outliers. So we tend to, to say at least six. Um, yeah, anything? Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to a slide you um, uh, that talks a little bit more about that in a bit, because um, you'll probably want to then follow that up with some quant, right, to validate if you can. Yeah. Oh, sorry, could we get a mic up here? Thank you. I was just going to ask if there were any uh, um, recommended suggestions on how to do research, because when you hear research and then you see the slide of the different types of quantitative research and all different types of research, it becomes like a daunting thing that a lot of entrepreneurs kind of get deterred from because mathematics, right? You, yeah. Research is like linear algebra, really. It's, it, well, to a person it isn't familiar with. Um, is there any simplified methods? Is research really just understanding the question you're trying to ask or the data that you need and really simply just typing those words? into different channels to see what information you get back because it just seems yeah. daunting. Yeah, we, great question. And it does seem daunting, doesn't it? That's so valid and fair. Um, we will talk more about some, some ways to do it. But you, just, you basically said exactly what we tell companies when we meet them, that our goal is to answer whatever question you have. So yes, that's what research is. It's answering kind of whatever question you're looking to to find an answer to, but we'll talk about some um, some strategies to do research, uh, you know, more scrappy research mm -hmm. projects, uh, one-off versus kind of the more robust projects. Yep. Yeah. All right. So let's go into. Go ahead, Amy. Do you want to do this? <laughs> well, oh, we yeah. were going to take a little break. We are using up our time. Uh, fine, but uh, we wanted to take a little time to have you all think about. Some, some business objectives that are ready for consumer research. So um, we can also use this as maybe just a one minute stretch break. Um, but just think about where you're at in your companies and you know, what might be ripe for research. And feel free to share with us or ask us questions as you're thinking this through. Yeah, or if anyone wants to share a little bit about your business and an example of an area, a goal you have in your business strategy right now, and we could maybe talk through how research would help with that. Casey. <laughs> um, so my name is Kiana Hicks, and I'm starting um, a new business and that has to do with technology, and it's application-based. And part of my research that I will need to um, do, do more of is understanding behaviors of my different markets and the different segments within the market, um, from 
you know, pricing, strategizing, and what they're spending their dollars on from a digital standpoint to um, costs for the, the different types of services that are offered through my platform and so forth. Um, and then where my markets live digitally or in the World Wide Web. So there's so many different facets of data that I have to research to be able to, one, tell the story, um, which why my product can be useful, um, but also talk about the behaviors and trends and patterns and where minds fall into play. Um, so yeah, it's, there's, and then, you know, you mentioned this is a product where it's different. It's a conglomerate of different types of services, and there's just not one out there like that to easily kind of do some mat pricing comparison to. So you're going to have to kind of break it down into different puzzle pieces and dissect the different types of services and compare it and to come up with a good, an, you know, an in-between number. So it's one of those things, and I think research is just going to be my saving grace for a lot of decision making as I get started. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it sounds like you do have a lot you're thinking through, <laughs> so can understand sort of why it feels a little overwhelming. Um, I think just centering on sort of, you know, what's maybe the first, it doesn't have to be the only, but what's yeah. the first thing that will help me to really get started? And maybe focus on that. You know, we find that sort of bite-sized chunks help in, in thinking things through or, or getting you know, off the ground. So um, whether that's pricing, maybe think through who are the competitors in this space, have a couple of conversations um, and start there and then kind of build onto that as you move forward. We I was thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of takes a little bit of soul searching maybe and mm -hmm. thinking about like what keeps you up at night? What is that business challenge or thing that is that first thing you really need to crack right now, focus on that one, a small one. Because if you think about all the, re I mean, research is like your, I don't know, your, your business strategy is one leg and research is the other. And they're gonna be walking this whole journey together. So there is plenty of time to, to test all the various things you wanna test, but really start with what's that next thing I need to do and what's a little bit of research I can do to to validate it or just make sure that I'm staying in the right direction. And then what's the next piece and the next piece. Yeah. And I would definitely encourage you to uh, start a list, right? Start jotting all these questions down, all these things. And then, like Amy said, when we were looking at the objectives, um, bucket some of that too. Maybe you can start thinking about certain types of questions you wanna ask certain groups of, of customers or prospects and then other ones. But just keep that list going because there will always be questions. The market will always be changing. Your customers will always be changing. There's always gonna be research that's needed. Yeah. So yeah, really center on what, what's that next thing? What's the and, fire? Yeah. yeah. And I'll just chime in. One additional strategy, I know we said don't try to validate something that you want to be true, but validation can be a really great tool to put something on paper um, could be totally made up. Just kind of put down what's in your gut, put it on paper, and put that in front of a customer. And get their, get their gut check, get their reaction. Does this feel right? Why or why not? And that will really help you refine um, and, and move forward. And that's a way to not necessarily start from scratch. Um, even our clients who might be under some resource constraints want, ask and want to start there and then just refine as we go. And that's okay too. Okay, everyone who is able or able-bodied or wants to, if you could stand up and just move. <laughs> it's 3 p.m., come on. Everyone's getting tired, hungry, at home too. <laughs> stand up, take your slippers off, move around in your jammies. Good, thank you. Um, okay, let's keep going. So as we've mentioned, we want to talk a little bit about methods. We'll go over this pretty quickly. There are a lot of different types of research. The three main ones that we'll focus on are qualitative, quantitative, and secondary. Qualitative research. Qualitative research answers the why. Um, why is a customer wanting this? Why are they asking, or why do they answer something a certain way? It really digs deep to understand what's behind that uh, initial behavior, right? What's the thought process? 
Uh, it's a smaller sample size, so as we mentioned, it might be talking to six customers or prospects of a certain segment, six of another. Um, it's not statistically significant, so it's for very important for directional purposes, but it's something you might want to use in tandem with some other strategies. Um, and it's a little less structured, right? So you're having a conversation in qualitative research. This could be as simple as taking a customer out to coffee and sitting down and talking with them. Um, or it could be a focus group, right? It could be bringing five of your, of your main customers together to work together to come up with a new version of the app that they want to see right? or new features. Quantitative research is uh, data, right? It's bigger data sets, it's surveys, it's statistically significant. Uh, this is to kind of size your market, right? Or to validate the things you're hearing in qualitative research. Um, and then we don't want people to forget the power of secondary research. So that's, there's so much data out there, right? From uh, actual data sets you can find online to articles you can read around trend spotting or different things that are happening in the market, to looking at your competitors' websites, to mining social media. Maybe you have a product that new moms really love. Go on the Pampers Facebook page, do some scrolling, see what people are talking about. There's so much data out there, it can be a very, you can take a little bit of a scrappy approach to put these different pieces together. Questions here? So a couple of tips we want to share for good research. Um, for our type of research, qualitative, where you're having a conversation, it is important to put together a list of questions. So it, it can be on the back of a napkin. We don't care. It can be uh, an Excel spreadsheet with a ton of organized questions. But what you want to do is you want to ask the same questions to all the people you're talking to or similar versions of them. Otherwise, what may happen is you'll start talking to a customer or a prospect, and then you'll get a little off track, which is our second point, that it's totally fine to, to let the conversation go where the customer or prospect wants it to go. But then all of a sudden, you get to the end, and you've, you've talked to 12 people. You have all this data, but you haven't asked them the same questions, so you can't identify any trends. So you want to make sure that you're asking the same general questions of people so you can hear how answers differ or are similar. But again, it's OK to go off script. Um, I think that's the beauty and what we love about Qual is sometimes the objectives are here, and then customers will talk about all sorts of crazy things here, and this ends up being the most valuable part of the research. Um, and that's it, it's what you're doing every day, right? You're talking to people, and something fantastic comes out of nothing. So um, let it go. Let the conversation flow, and you'll be surprised that Maybe the 10 features you thought were super important, they, they couldn't care less about. And there's this totally random new thing you hadn't thought about. So let the customers lead, the prospects lead. They're brilliant. They have great ideas. Um, we recommend using, this is very tactical, but using a free transcription service. Like we use Otter. Um, and basically, that can uh, take notes and record for you so that you can really focus on the conversation. And then thank you gifts go a long way. So in our line of research, we actually incent participants. So they get money for participating. Um, but if, if you just want to buy them a coffee or if you want to send them a little thank you gift, um, you want to thank people for taking the time to share their ideas with you. OK, so you now have the data. <laughs> now what? You're probably feeling overwhelmed again. <laughs> so I've collected all this great information. How, you know, for one, how do I act on it? How do I turn this into actual next steps? Two, how do I, you know, know what to focus on? Um, and I, you know, oftentimes we find ourselves even and our clients moving right into solutioning. We have all of this great information. We want, we want to do this and this and this and this, and it's very exciting, and it is. Um, but here's again where we do recommend taking a step back and just kind of thinking through, you know, what are the nuggets that we really want to focus on, at least for now. And there are a couple of different questions to ask or things to consider as you are prioritizing and kind of translating all of this information into your next steps. Um, sometimes it's very clear. You know, if the goal was to understand what our pricing strategy is, um, and that is how success is going to be measured, then that's great, and we'll take all the information that will lead us to that. Um, but sometimes the end goal is a little bit bigger than that. It might be how do we, you know, attract 
X type of customer. And so based on all the data you have, you kind of want to bucket the key insights into that bucket. What are all of the pieces of information that will help me achieve this goal? And maybe those are, that's the information you want to focus on. Again, for now, you might have all this other information and data that you collected through your survey or through the conversations, and that's awesome. Don't throw that away, but maybe save it for later and act on it once you've figured out this, this first key piece. Um, another way, a really uh, important and helpful consideration as you're thinking about what to do next is what are our resource constraints? You know, maybe we heard all this awesome information about what our next product innovation is going to be, but we do not have the budget to be able to execute on that right now. So let's focus first on this really meaningful little enhancement that will cost essentially nothing that consumers will really find valuable. Um, that's another way to determine where to start or what pieces of data you want to act on. Um, what are table stakes versus differentiators? You know, what's the low-hanging fruit versus what's further out? These are all good questions to ask yourself to kind of figure out what are the what are the pieces that are really meaningful to us right now? What will get us the biggest bang for our buck? Um, that could be something really huge and really game-changing for your business. It could be something really small that costs nothing but will make a big change for you and for, for your business and for sales. So, um, so again, before diving in and just kind of wanting to act on all of the, the information you gather, kind of again prioritize and think about where you want to start. Um, yeah, next slide. So here's where we did want to talk about where to start. Here's where there are a lot of free options. There are a lot of things you can do to just get started here. Um, it might not be hiring you know, a fancy agency, and that's OK. Um, again, our philosophy is any research is better than no research. And so we have a lot of Fortune 100 companies even that come to us and have um, you know, not a lot they can spend. And we just give them different options of things they can do with that budget. So here are, here are a list of totally free ways to start. One is SurveyMonkey. Um, you can sign up with SurveyMonkey. You can set up a survey. Uh, you can send it out to people you know. I think I'm quite certain SurveyMonkey, for relatively reasonable, will also allow you, um, will get, kind of recruit your participants for you. And if it's a basic recruit, they'll just let you send that survey to 500, 1,000 different people, and you can pretty uh, affordably get responses. Um, again, talk to your current clients and prospects. These could be people you know. These could be people that come into your store. Just pull them aside and ask if they have five minutes. These could be people um, that you know are, are purchasing from you online. Uh, send them an email and ask if you could have a little bit of their time. Um, people are, are really willing to talk about themselves <laughs> and talk about their experiences. So for a very small thank you incentive or even nothing at all, the, they're more than likely going to be willing to do this. Um, go to community organizations, again, interview students at schools, um, see if you can have a, a classroom take on your, your business challenge as their project. Mm -hmm. um, again, conduct secondary research, there's tons of great information out there. Um, and then mind social media. I mean, this has become huge in the last couple of years where you can just go on TikTok which I know nothing about, but go on TikTok, <laughs> go on Instagram, and you can look up a plethora of information from um, people who are posting specifically about your, you know, maybe not your product, but your competitors' products or that industry in general, and you can learn a ton of information about what they like, what they don't like, what they're looking for um, by just seeing what people are posting. So again, a lot of really great free ways to, to start here. So are there any questions? Here we wanted to move into sort of putting it all together and we wanted to just give you a couple examples of problems or questions our clients have come to us with and how we've, uh, how we've helped them to answer those. Any questions before we get there? Yeah? Yeah, I had a question. Oh, oh moin, sweet. So I had a question as we talked a little bit earlier, we talked about the competitive analysis audit. You know, what are some things that you guys at your company are able to pick up that if someone did it on their own, they may skip a step that's like super critical to have like a comprehensive um, yeah. an, uh, assessment of a competitive analysis? Do you want to go to the Stinson example? Yep. And I'll think that. Start there. So I'll give you a real life example. So uh, Stinson, Leonard, Stinson Leonard Street is a law firm that came to us. 
Um, they were a result of a couple of different acquisitions, uh, had kind of recently they had undergone some acquisitions, and were at the point of uh, not really just agreeing internally on who they were and, and what they were about, and so they wanted to just uh, have a little bit more focus around how they talked about themselves as a company, um, get all of the attorneys on the same board as to here it is, here is what we do and here is how we should all talk about our company. Um, and so we headed into some work with them to help them really uh, determine who they are, uh, what their core competencies are, how they should talk about themselves. And a really critical step was a competitive audit. And so the little chart you see at the bottom, I know the words are tiny, but that was a look into um, all the different uh, regional, uh, they're a regional firm, so regional competitors, um, and we just mined their websites to really look into what were they focusing on and kind of evaluated them on a number of different attributes um, and then plotted them out. So this law firm really highlights this and this and this and this expertise, this other firm highlights these other things, and that allowed us to sort of see the white space. Um, what are none of these other companies touching? And so how can we really focus on that white space and talk about our company in that way? And that was just by looking at their, their websites and the messages the, the, um, that they were promoting on, on their website and social and you know, out in the world, um, not just website, but, um, but a pretty you know, easy, in quotation marks, scan of, of what they were saying. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah, and depending on your, your types of customers, and I, I don't know, with the B2B space, they're a little bit less willing to engage in some of our fluffier activities, like describe each company to me in this space as a celebrity, as a type of car. Um, for this project, we did ask, like, what's the type of car that each um, company is? And you might hear, oh, X company is a Ferrari, really showy and expensive, uh, good for certain occasions, but not my everyday. Uh, this company is a Subaru, right? They're reliable, not super sexy, but I can use them. In, they're really adaptable, right? I can put my kids in the car, I can go hiking, I can do whatever. Um, this company is a, an old clunker and just moving slow in the market. So, these projective techniques actually work really well to understand at a deeper level uh, how you fit in and the value you offer. We'll go to two more examples and then we'll leave time for um, any last questions. But here's another example of a project we did a number of years ago. We're sharing older projects so the information is no longer um, proprietary or we can, we can share out loud here. So, Excel Energy came to us and they wanted to create a home energy app. They had never done this before and um, they, yeah, they wanted to create something for their customers. So we did research here in Minnesota. We went into people's homes, uh, did kind of home tours, learned all about uh, their biggest concerns about energy, the things they care about, the things that they don't understand at all. Like, what are all these things on my bill? How does that translate to my energy use? Here's what I really want to know. We brought um, the customers in to Fusion Hill to our offices with all of, a bunch of our clients, so people from the engineering team, people from the marketing team, um, to co-create is what we call it. So they all spent two hours coming up with app ideas together, building their own apps, building out the features they want to see, and then we translated that into five key principles that they should keep in mind when they're developing this app. Um, we circled back with them once the app launched and they shared with us that not only had it won an award for um, the great design of this app, the great features in the launch, but also they said, we go back to those five principles every day. When we're sitting in a meeting and we're thinking about what is the, you know, we want to add this feature or we want to change the way this flows, we make our team think through the five things. Is it, you know, actionable? Does it do this? Does it do this? That came out of the customer research. Um, so again, a great example of how customer research can inform not only that initial build out, but then also the principles that you need to take into every single stage and think about. 
And that, that was really the key insight here. So we were asking, this is an image of you know, their drawing of what this app could look like. You know, we're not taking that word for word necessarily, but using that to, to understand what, what customers are looking for, what's really valuable in an app, um, what's beneficial to drive those principles. So again, we're not asking for the answers. We're asking them to elaborate and explain why the app is this way to help us get to those guiding principles. And then the last one we'll talk about is um, a project we did for 18 Birdies, which is a golf app. It does a whole bunch of things. Um, if you're a golfer, check them out. If you're a golfer, you probably know about them. Um, I am not a golfer, and the night before we headed out on the research, I went to Dick's Sporting Goods, and I bought a bunch of golf clothes, and like tore the tags off, and had to pretend to be a golfer, because we went out on golf courses in Jacksonville, Florida, and Arizona, Phoenix, and all over with, uh, with women. The goal of this research was um, there's a group of, uh, an underserved group here in golf, which is women who golf. And it's also not a huge market, but it could grow a lot. So what are, at a big picture, what are, um, uh, what's missing for women in golfing and what's making them fall out of their golf journey at various points versus continuing and really loving the sport? So we did, uh, we were able to see kind of, I see a head nod, you must be a golfer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we heard all about these moments that really uh, uh, keep you away from the sport, uh, don't make you continue. And then we really helped um, 18 birdies figure out how to get more women into golf. This work was uh, in partnership with the LPGA. So it launched uh, 18 birdies and LPGA's partnership with a, a white paper showing our findings here. Um, we also helped them with the app itself. So we had women go through the app, try it out, and point out all the things that didn't work for them. For instance, there's a feature that they were contemplating where you would be able to meet up with someone to play golf. So you might not have someone who, who can golf with you that day, so you could find people through the app. Well, as a woman in golf, that felt really weird. They wanted to set a lot of parameters around, okay, I don't want to be set up with, with a guy who's going to golf and golf too fast or think that I don't, I'm not on his skill level. You know, I want to find someone who I can partner with who's going to make sense. Um, they had a lot of suggestions around the actual content. The content was kind of um, bro-focused, I'd <laughs> say. Uh, and they really wanted to understand, uh, like, female celebrities or female businesswomen or people they uh, look up to who golf and how they got into it and the struggles. So yeah, a lot of great uh, learnings from this project. This is an example of a lot of objectives, but they had the money and the time to do a really robust project. So again, if you're, if you're limited on time, money, keep it small. If you have a lot of objectives you want to answer all at once, by all means, go for it. Just be ready to, to do big research. So with that, we end. <laughs>